you see here is the Cleveland Clinic campus, which is one of the big hospitals in the United States, and I hope that some of you will come and visit in the future, and you will be very welcome. So today we're going to talk about inflammatory bowel disease, which uh, has Dr. Yamamoto mentioned, is a disease that is spreading around the world. And the question is, why do we have Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis throughout the world now, or almost throughout the world, and why is our disease increases? What has happened in the last 100 years or so that has changed the situation so dramatically? So before World War II, basically, we, there was very little knowledge and very little presence of the disease primarily in the northern countries of Europe and in North America. But as time went by, in the second couple of decades, then the disease started to appear in other countries like Europe, South Africa, in Oceania, in Australia. And with time, you know, other countries developed and the countries where the disease appeared first, there were more cases and more severe cases. And uh, now we have a situation in which uh, the disease is present, even though may not recognized, in throughout the world. And the question is, is this going to be the picture of inflammatory bowel disease in the future? Will all the countries in the world have a lot of Crohn's disease and a lot of ulcerative colitis? It's important to remember that this phenomenon is not restricted to Crohn's and colitis, but many other what we call immune-mediated chronic inflammatory diseases like psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis is exactly the same phenomenon. This is important to notice because as important meaning, it means that something has changed in the environment or in the humans that, pro that now promotes the presence of chronic inflammation in various organs, and IBD happens to be in the intestine, small bowel, large bowel, in other parts. This is part of an overall change of the type of diseases that humanity is suffering. If you look at what people were dying in 1900 and in the 2000s, there is a very dramatic difference. In the 1900s, it was primarily infectious diseases, and now people dry, die primarily of chronic inflammatory diseases, cardiovascular diseases, metabolic diseases. So something has happened that changed the spectrum of diseases worldwide. This is a classical picture from Dr. Jean-François Bach from France showing a phenomenon which is very well established where we see the inflammatory diseases declining over the years. At the same time, the increase of chronic inflammatory diseases, IBD, <clears throat> rheumatoid arthritis, IPD step one, and so on. So these are real phenomenon. So something has happened. When we look at the causes of diseases, we look for the factors associated with the disease. What factors are conditioning the disease? And the question becomes, have they changed over the years? And one of the things that we have seen a lot of publications and gained a lot of information in the last 10 or 20 years is about genetics. So the question becomes, have the gene changed over the years, and now because of genetic alterations, we have inflammatory bowel disease? That does not appear to be the case. This is a study that we've done at, in, in Cleveland in collaboration with University of Pittsburgh, where we see the distribution of Crohn disease-associated genes between normal population in blue and in Crohn's disease in red. And what you see, a big overlap. That means that people that do not have the disease also have the same genetic variations. I can guarantee you that in this room, there are many people, many of you, have Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis associated variations without having the disease. Another piece of evidence that genes are only a part, perhaps a small part of the story, is this. What you see on the left is a Neanderthal, Homo sapiens, which lived between 200,000 and 40,000 years ago. And on the right, you see a modern human. There's a paper showing that genetic variations associated with Crohn's disease were already present in very primitive humans. Obviously, they did not have Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. 
And that means that the genetic variation have existed for a long time, but it's really not the primary responsible for the disease. So what happened to the genes? Have the genes adapted over the years? Have they changed over the years? And then now we have diseases like IBD, or the genes are degenerating like we <laughs> happens both in the United States and in South America. And I think that actually the two examples at the bottom are not genetic. So another evidence that something beyond the genes has happened, and we look at population shifts. When we move people from what used to be actually low areas of incidence of Crohn's and colitis to regions high incidence, like Europe or North America, if the person move as an adult, they will not develop IBD. But if they move as young people, the chance of development of IBD was as high as the local population or even higher, like is happening in Canada. That tells us very strongly that the genes move, but the genes in the country of origins do not condition the disease, but when they move to a certain environment, certain countries, then the disease develop. This goes along with the famous hygiene hypothesis that proposes that we have changed the environment from one with a lot of infectious diseases, a lot of difficulties in living, poor alimentation, poor sanitation, to one in which are becoming increasingly clean, increasingly healthy. But there's a price to pay for that because the education of our immune system basically depends on how dirty we are, what kind of bacterial load we carry. And they have very good experimental data to prove that. This is a study done in Scotland. And what you see here are <coughs> puercos sucios y los puercos limpios. The dirty pig are left in the environment and, let, and they eat whatever they can, when they can, and do whatever they want. And the clean pig are kept inside in a closed environment, and they're giving a very specialized diet and antibiotics. And when you look what happens, the dirty pigs have a lot of healthy microbiota, and they have a balanced immunity. While the clean pig kept under artificial conditions, they have changes in the microbiota, and the gene expression is a pro-inflammatory one. That's why we see a book like this one. This is from Brett Finley, a prominent microbiologist in Canada. And this book has had a lot of success. Let's eat dirt, primarily in children, which basically translate to let's expose young individuals to as much environmental factors and bacteria and microbes as possible. What has happened with the modernization? One factor that has been shown very clearly, primarily by study by Martin Blazer, is that we have changed the microbiota. Microbiota is not just bacteria, it's everything else. Our viruses, fungi. If from a rich microbiota in the past, where we were exposed to many environmental factors, we have now depleted the microbiota. And with the depletion of the microbiota, we have less education or weaker edu education of the immune system. And when we get challenges in a modern world where we have to deal with many unknown factors, our immune system seems to be less prepared to be effective and eliminate the aggression. And we develop inflammation, which is not very effective and continuous and continuous and continuous, conditioning chronic inflammatory diseases like Crohn's and colitis. This is another very good example. Children that have Helicobacter pylori have much less asthma than children that do not have. In other words, the cleaner you are, the more you have modern diseases. This is also true in inflammatory bowel disease, study done in Denmark, showing that when the child gets a lot of antibiotics early in life, and the more antibiotics the child gets, the higher the chance of developing inflammatory bowel disease. And there's a clear correlation between chronic inflammatory diseases, immune mediators, and the wealth of a nation. The poorer the nation, the lower the GDP, the more infectious diseases, less IBD, and vice versa. We as humans have changed dramatically what we do. 
This is a study about human behavior. And when you see the different, how do we spend our time? You know, in an office, uh, at the restaurant, in the, inside, on in a vehicle, outdoors. And we basically spend 70% of our time inside. When humans were born, there was no inside. You're outside all the time or in a cave. But now, almost 90% of our time is inside and is sedentary. We sit in front of a computer. We don't exercise. We don't do anything like old humans were doing. So we have changed who we are. And the big question is, um, what have changed the most? Probably the thing that we've changed the most is what we eat. And the question becomes, los alimentos contribuyen para la aparición de las enfermedades inflamatorias intestinales. Y la respuesta es sí. There are studies that compare old diets to new diets. A group of pediatricians in Florence, led by Dr. Leonetti, did a very important study years ago that was published in PNAS. They went to a country in West, northern West Africa, Burkina Faso, which is a very primitive country. And they study population that lives basically in paleolithic conditions, like the old humans. And they study their diet. And their diet is basically a bunch of natural products. And then they compare the content of those food, the amount of calories or fibers and so on, in children in the Burkina Faso area and the European children. And you can see that energy, moisture, protein, fat, carbohydrate were all low, but a lot of fibers. And when you look at European children, it's exactly the opposite. Too much calories, too much proteins, too much fat, too much carbohydrate, and low fiber. Because we have inverted a healthy primitive diet to a modern one. And with that, we change dramatically the microbiota. If we look at the microbial composition in rural Africa and in Europe, there's a complete inversion of the type and quantity and quality of bacteria. And with that, we change also the calories. So basically, in modern society, we eat too much, and the quality of our food, which is abundant, is very poor. One of the examples in Japan, Japan was a country where was basically living off rice and fish until World War II. And then with Western influence, they start to eat milk product, hamburgers, meat, and so on, and the disease appeared. Obviously, these are just correlative studies. We behave a certain way, and we have disease in a certain way. But basically, and I was having breakfast with Dr. Yamamoto this morning, we agreed that what we eat every day on a regular basis is basically a pro-inflammatory diet. We use a lot of artificial sweeteners that change the, the microbiota. Emulsifiers are you know, all the food that we eat because to be commercialized, a product must have emulsifiers. We smoke, we use excess of salt, excess of fat, and all of these to chronic inflammatory diseases, one of them being IBD. And there's a lot of evidence that environmental factors are associated with IBD. Excess of fat, particular matters, in other words, pollution, maternal obesity, excess of salt. And the experimental level, you can show that all of these factors cause inflammatory bowel disease in animal models or make inflammatory bowel disease in animal model worse. So I believe that the diet, among the many, many environmental factors through epigenetic influences, are the most important factor that condition inflammatory bowel disease because the diet affects directly the metabolism, the gut microbiota, and the immune system. And in fact, what we do, what we call epigenetic studies. So a gene, which is basically what condition our behavior, is modified before it's expressed. And what we call modification, a gene we call epigenetics. So again, in experimental models, if we have a healthy diet, fruit, vegetables, fish, you know, and we look at the response of the genes in tissues like the colon, the fat, and the liver, we have what we call histone modification. You don't have to. We don't, we're not going to go into detail that, but basically the DNA is modified depending on the influences that come from the environment. And if we have a healthy diet, we have a normal gene expression. 
But when the same animals offer the matter the same humans, the same people, eat a Western diet rich in salt and fat, and in the same tissues, the modification of gene expression are different, the chromatin adapt in a way that alt cause alteration of gene expression towards a pro-inflammatory pattern. So basically, if we ask the question, what has changed, what do we have IBD? I think that is basically a phenomenon of human evolution. Human evolution as well, life on Earth has existed for billions of years. And it's been a very, very slow process. And now, in the last 100 years, because of the Industrial Revolution that started in England in the late 1800s, we have completely changed the way we are, we behave, and now we basically have not had the time to adapt the body to the changes imposed by the new environment. As the price to pay is chronic inflammation, in the case of inflammatory bowel disease, of the, of the intestine is Crohn's and colitis. So if you want to look at the cause of inflammatory bowel disease, all you have to look into the mirror and you'll find the cause is yourself or ourselves. And with this, I close and I thank you very much.